This is FM Gold Channel of All India Radio. In the program Spotlight, now we bring you a discussion on India-US cooperation in Indo-Pacific region and in energy sector. The participants are Ashok Sajjanhar, former diplomat, and Simran Sodhi, journalist. Today we are discussing the upcoming visit of the US President Donald Trump and the First Lady to India. The US President will be here on a two-day trip on 24th and 25th of February. Many areas on which bilateral relationship will be focused. India-US relationship also specifically focus on the India-Pacific region and the India-US cooperation in the region and also the energy sector in which India's growing demand for energy is being fulfilled by many nations including the US today. Ambassador Sajanhar, when you see this upcoming visit of the US President to India and we also see that today we also got comments from an US official saying that US looks India as one of the main pillars of our Indo-Pacific strategy. How significant one is this statement and how important is this for India today that it is being seen as a pillar in the India-Pacific strategy by the United States? I think it's a very significant visit. In fact, it is not only visit of the president along with his wife, it has also become quite a family affair because the daughter Ivanka and uh, the son-in-law Jared Kushner, they are also coming with the President and the First Lady. As far as the Indo-Pacific is concerned, it is uh, both uh, the United States and India are very significant and very vital partners in this strategy. You would recall that the whole idea of Indo-Pacific was launched by President Donald Trump himself during his first year in tenure when he visited Asia in November 2017 basically also to participate in the East Asia Summit. But also he made a number of bilateral visits to Japan, to South Korea, to China and others. That is the time when he started using the expression Indo-Pacific. Although one must also recognize that about more than 10 years ago, the idea of Indo-Pacific was launched by the Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe when he had come to India on a bilateral visit and while addressing the joint session of the Indian Parliament, He had mentioned the strategic significance of treating both the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean as one common region because the stability, security of the region and the world depends upon these two oceans. Then because at that time China had not taken very kindly to what was being done and the military exercises also that took place between the four countries, India, United States, Japan and Australia. So the idea was shelved for some time. But then it again got a fresh lease of life when President Donald Trump was here and he, on every occasion, he would mention the term Indo-Pacific instead of Asia-Pacific because in Indo-Pacific it focuses also on the importance and significance not only of the Indian Ocean but of India in terms of economic prosperity and security of the region. Later on, the U.S. Pacific Command, the name of that was also changed to Indo-Pacific Command. Along with that, the first meeting of the four countries, the Quad as it is called, U.S., India, Japan and Australia, that also at mid-official level had taken place on the sidelines of the East Asia Summit in Manila in 2017. And that has also been meeting very significantly. We are aware that uh, the Prime Minister had given our own thinking on uh, this uh, subject, on the issue of the Indo-Pacific at his address at the Shangri-La Dialogue two years ago. So this is uh, extremely important and it really is at the foundation of the strategic partnership between India and the United States. Ambassador Sajjanhar, as you explained, and we also had another statement coming from the U.S. today, as the U.S. also gets ready for this visit, and the official has said that the U.S. wants an India that is strong with a capable military that supports peace, stability, and rules-based order in the Indo-Pacific region. So when we emphasize on the rule-based orders, can we kind of conclude that somewhere the U.S. and India, when they come together, we are actually hinting towards China, whose behavior in the South China Sea has been very aggressive and China's rise has not been comfort of many in the world. Would you say that there is a hint or more than a hint when we emphasize rules-based order in the region towards China? International laws and international regulations that are designed to conduct affairs between different states, between different countries. And many of those 
issues many of those laws and regulations have been thrown to the winds by China and that has become cause of very serious concern by India definitely because India is in a very specific position because other countries like Japan, like ASEAN, like even the United States or Europe, they are really concerned about the maritime aspects that it should be open, it should be free Indo-Pacific so that uh, cargo, traffic, etc. can travel without any hindrance. But as far as India is concerned, uh, we have a 4,000 kilometer long disputed border with China. So the intransigence and uh, the assertiveness of China is a matter of very serious concern as far as India is concerned. So in that context, uh, this suggestion that we want a rules-based order, basically that the UN Convention on Law of the Sea, that needs to be respected because we have seen in South China Sea, it is a huge water body of about 3.9 million square kilometers and China has laid claim to about 80% of that. It is not only in terms of uh, the fact that it provides waterways for international trade and commerce, but it is also extremely rich in uh, minerals, whether it is oil or gas, or other minerals or fisheries. As a result of that, China has laid claim to that, notwithstanding the fact that its contention, all of South China Sea has historically been under the control of China because some of its uh, fishermen were had gone fishing about 2,000 kilometers away from the Chinese uh, shores. So that argument which had been made by China, that was not accepted and all its contentions were rejected when Philippines had taken it to the Permanent Court of Arbitration at The Hague. But uh, notwithstanding the totally adverse judgment of the Permanent Court of Arbitration, China has continued to occupy all the big islands like the Paracela Island, the Spratly Islands, also the Scarborough Shoals, and uh, also creating uh, new artificial islands in that region. It has put its own uh, naval equipment and bombers on these islands, so that has raised the tension. And other countries like Philippines, which have a claim on these islands and the areas, they are not able to utilize them, they are not able to exploit them to the fullest extent. But uh, China is uh, in violation of its commitments under the international law. So definitely this statement is straight point towards the behavior of China in recent years. Ambassador Fezabar, we see that one more area that will be in focus when the U.S. president visits is going to be the energy sector. We also see that today India is the fifth largest economy in the world. We have growing massive energy demands. In 2016, the energy exports from the US to India grew by 500% to nearly 7 billion US dollars. This energy area, how much does it offer an avenue for India and the US to further their cooperation? Very much. I think this is a very promising area which has a huge potential. This is because over the last few years, the United States has emerged as the largest exporter also of energy, of oil and gas, shale oil and shale gas. Earlier, it was said that the major interest of the United States as far as West Asian countries or North Africa, whether it is Libya or in the Gulf, it is Iraq or Saudi Arabia or Bahrain or Qatar, it was basically because it wanted energy, it wanted oil from these countries. So that is why it uh, wanted a presence there and wanted to ensure that its own interests were not adversely affected in any manner. But now that it has become net exporter energy of oil and gas, so it would like to find uh, stable markets, growing markets, reliable markets for its uh, energy. India being the third largest importer of oil and gas in the world, of course, uh, does present uh, those opportunities. For us also, it is a matter of great benefit and advantage because we are uh, such large importers of energy. We import more than 80% of our oil needs and more than 40% of our gas needs. And uh, so far, we have been doing it, much of it from the Middle East. Then after the withdrawal of the United States from the JCPOA or the Iranian nuclear deal, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, decided it sort of gave, issued a policy decision that uh, no countries would be allowed to import oil from uh, Iran. And India has been a very significant uh, importer of energy from Iran. We import about 10 to 12 percent of our oil needs from there. So not getting that from Iran 
of course is a matter of uh, as far as our own uh, economy is concerned it has an adverse impact but to meet uh, this energy security within the country we have been importing uh, oil from uh, the united states another function is that uh, india has a trade surplus with the united states one of the few countries with which india has a trade surplus and uh, from our point of view significant trade surplus from the point of view of the united states it is very minuscule it's just about 20 or billion dollars and uh, mr trump determines the health or any bilateral relationship based on uh, the trade balance between the two countries so he has been uh, speaking about that india is a tariff king india has such uh, high tariffs even just now he has said that india has not treated uh, us fairly and when he comes here he will uh, sort of speak about it to the prime minister so when we are importing this about 6 billion dollars of energy every year and if this continues and if this further increases then it will go a long way in uh, bridging the trade uh, deficit that the united states has and trade surplus that india has so it will make the trade uh, more balanced which again uh, will be welcomed by the united states it will be welcomed by india also ambassador sarjana as you just talked in detail about how the energy relationships and the energy cooperation between india and the us is expanding and how the future looks at we also see that one aspect of energy cooperation between india and the united states and that has been under discussion for a long time now is the civil nuclear cooperation we also have had a deal with a us company westington house and india to build at least six nuclear reactors in the state of andhra pradesh how significant is this deal and how much do you see a bright future as far as india and the us is concerned specifically when it comes to nuclear cooperation the possibilities are looking attractive right as we go into the future listeners would recall that the framework agreement for india us civil nuclear energy cooperation was signed in july 2005 when dr manmohan singh had uh, gone to the united states of course the seeds were sown when mr atal bihari vajpayee was the prime minister and the bilateral dialogue between the us deputy secretary of state stroke talbot and jaswan singh the agreement was finally signed in 2008 unfortunately because of the liability issues what is the liability of the american companies will have to face if there is an accident in india as far as the nuclear installation is concerned so on those accounts and the laws that had been passed by the indian parliament we could not really take matters forward in a very significant manner us company that was uh, engaged in conversation that also was going through its uh, pangs of bankruptcy a large number of issues as to why the india us nuclear energy cooperation could not uh, proceed further but now westinghouse has been able to come out of those bankruptcy things there have been uh, discussions the liability issue was sorted out uh, in 2014 november when mr modi had met uh, barack obama on the sidelines of the east asia summit in myanmar so that had been taken care of by creating a special fund from which payments would be made out if an accident were to take place but still india had some concern level of technology about the type of technology that the united states has does it have the latest technology or is the ariva from france is it better or the vver from russia which we have been using to construct the kudan kulam reactors is that better so now i think uh, our people are actively engaged with whiting house to be able to understand and see what they have to offer what they can offer and uh, it has been decided that in andhra pradesh we would have uh, six 1100 megawatt power plants that would be established which makes it about 6600 megawatt of uh, power that will be generated so i think uh, when president trump comes here and discussions take place this would be an important element of uh, bilateral uh, cooperation and some agreements uh, are likely to be signed and announced during the visit with this we bring today's discussion to an end thank you thank you you were listening to a discussion on india us cooperation in indo pacific region and in energy sector the participants were ashok sajanhar former diplomat and simran sori journalist This program was produced and presented by the News Services Division of All India Radio. This program is also available on our website newsonair.com. You can also follow us on the News on Air app for updates. You may email your opinion about this program at airnstalks@gmail.com. At